Amen. Good. It's a little warm today. A nice, beautiful day. We're so glad that you have chosen to return to the, the Rolling Hills Church to worship the Lord today. Our church family is away, and we've talked about it today at Vallejo Drive, and we want to pray for Dr. Kidder in a special way as he makes his presentations, that they might be effective, and that certainly our church family members, our pastor and those that are there, might receive a blessing. But we've come here because we need a blessing too, amen? And certainly we are looking to the Lord for that blessing. Let's bow our heads. Great God of heaven, in the brief moments that we have to worship you in the preaching event, we ask that your guidance be with us. Guide our words. Guide our meditation. That we might have our minds stayed on you. That we might continue to be your witnesses. That we might reflect your love, your kindness. That we might reflect your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John. What book did I say? The book of John, chapter 17. You're all familiar with this text of Scripture. Jesus was about to go to the cross. He, he was facing Calvary. And he recognized and wanted us to know that he wanted us to be with him when he would come into his kingdom. How many of you want to be in the kingdom with God? Amen. I know I do. And today we want to talk about how we might be able to do that in an effective way. How can we be in the kingdom of God? We're going to talk about prayer today. How many of you pray? Everybody prays. Amen. And certainly we're going to talk about one of the methods one of the opportunities we have to get into the kingdom of God through prayer. The book of John, chapter 17, the Bible reads in verse 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, Jesus says, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory, verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. The title of today's message, simply, Carrying a Weight. Carrying a Weight. Now I know I just prayed, but let's pray again. Father in heaven, I personally need you to guide me through this sermon. The material is here, but we need your spirit. We need your spirit to guide us through your, your words so that we can really draw close to you, that we can really be like Christ. And we'll give you the glory now, the praise, and the honor. Again, in Jesus' name. Amen. We have heard of the desire of ages. And of course, that book was written about Jesus Christ. But I want to talk to you about the desire of Jesus. His desire was to express love, compassion, and understanding to everyone. How many people did I say? Everyone, Dina. The Bible says that People came to Jesus, 
And the Bible says that he had compassion on them and healed everyone that came to him. Jesus was concerned about everyone. He wanted to show love, compassion, and understanding to everyone that he came in contact with. That's difficult, Alice, if it's you and me. Because we have preconceived ideas about how people should be. Amen. I'm so glad that Jesus did not have preconceived ideas about how people should be. Amen. He accepted everyone that came to him. He showed no discrimination. He showed no indifference. No preferential treatment. He simply accepted individuals for who they were and gave them the proper what? Respect, love, compassion, and understanding. Let's talk about Jesus' love. You know, Jesus' love is different than ours. Most of the time, our love is based on selfishness. Say amen, because it's the truth anyhow. Turn with me in the Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, you know it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Bible reads as follows. When you get it, or when you have it, say amen. Let's read and start with verse 4. The Bible says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Let's change that word charity into love because that is what it is. Love suffereth long and is what? Kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself is not what? In my version, puffed up. Verse 5. It doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. I'm, I am really concerned, not concerned, but I want to emphasize that in this text of Scripture, in verse 5, is very paramount, actually. It says that seeketh not her own. Love is a feminine thing. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, the Bible says that it seeketh not her own. Do you know that I am really excited about being married to Sister Barksdale. We've been married 32 years, 34 years. And in that 34 years, I have learned that I'm a little different than she is. My, I, I'm, you know, Sister Barksdale is a little bit more tender than I am. Sister Barksdale is a little bit more compassionate than I am. Sister Barksdale tends to be a little bit more understanding than I am. Now, don't get me wrong. I am tender. I am compassionate. And I certainly try to listen. But, you know, I, I've watched ladies over the years, and certainly my wife is one of them, she will go out in the garden. See, I love planting, but Sonia will see something and 
she'll want to go get this one particular thing. See, when I plant, I just go out and buy a whole flat of flowers and just put them in the garden. But Sister Barksdale will go out and find the special plant. Amen. And what I'm trying to say is that when we refer to love as a feminine, or as I refer to love as a feminine thing, and as the Bible echoes that same thought process, women are more specific. Women pay closer touch to detail. Am I right? You guys can walk, but not in those what I'm talking about. Women can walk through the garden and touch every rose petal. I'm walking through, I got the water and I'm just, you know, gumming it. But she's paying close attention to detail. And so it is with Jesus. He plays, he pays close attention to detail. His love does not seek for itself. It seeks for the details in our lives. Come on, say amen. When Jesus loves, he loves with a compassion and tenderness. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it's very detailed. It is Ordered just for you, Sheila. Sister Falcone, it's good to see you. Jesus is detailed. He knows the very hairs, and our, they are numbered on our heads. Come on, say amen. He's detailed about you specifically. How many of you have problems? Certainly all of us do. Do you know that Jesus knew your problems before you had them? The Bible tells me in Isaiah 65, it says these words, before they call, talk about prayer now, before they call, I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. Jesus is already on your side, on your case, coming down your street, coming into your driveway, getting ready to park in your garage, may sleep in your bedroom, if you'll let him. Are you with me? He's concerned about the details of your life, so much so that when you are in trouble, he, he knew you were going to be in trouble before you got in trouble. and was already working it out. Before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear. He's interested in the details of your life even before you talk to him about the problems that, you, that exist in your life. He is already on your case. Come on, say amen, church. I like that about Jesus because I'm an accountant by trade and I love counting numbers. I've talked to you about it before. I, I, certainly I do. I really love counting numbers. I like columns and rows, and I like to see things add up and cr c come down. The other day I was uh, putting together a, a spreadsheet for my boss, Mr. O, the conference treasurer, and, and I, I added up the numbers, and the, the total number was right. Now, someone else had made this, this, this spreadsheet. And so I'm looking at the total number, in this one column, the number was correct, but then when I looked at the numbers that added across, they didn't add up. So I'm trying to figure out, so I had to figure out what the formula was for that particular sale, and I realized that there was, this particular column had gone all the way down to one sale on one line, and that one line had just been added by me, come on, say amen, See, I'm the one who messed it up. I added a line. And so now all the columns were totaling up except for this column because I added a number. But the, but the formula didn't take into account that number. And so I'm figuring, 
the totals were adding up, but the line across wasn't adding up. I figured it out, of course, and as that's, that's why I can tell you the story. Why am I telling you the story? Because I'm a detailed person in my mind. Do you know that Jesus is more detailed than I am in yours? If I can look for a one number, figure out that number, do you know that Jesus can figure out your stuff before you even can talk to him about it? I'm a human being. If I can figure it out, just this column, what kind of problems can you give Jesus that he can't figure out? Come on, say amen, church. We know that God can solve any problem. Amen. That's number one. His love is not about himself. His love is about you. It seeketh not her own. It's not easily puffed or provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. How many of us tell the truth all the time? There's no amen. How many of us tell the truth all the time? Thank you, Anita. Anita's like, you know what? I'm on top of that. Amen. Thank you for that, sister, because I believe she is. But most of us fall short. The Bible says, Jesus says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None cometh to the Father but by me. Love is truthful. Come on, say amen. And in the truth, and in the truth, as it is presented, does it hurt individuals? Brother Art, does the truth hurt? Sure it does. Sure it does. What do we do when the truth is told to us? Now I'm really asking questions. We get defensive. What else do we do? This is going to be, a, this is interactive. What else do we do? We deny the truth. We get defensive about the truth. What else do we do? We find excuses. Does Jesus find excuse? No. Why? Because he's got a pure heart developed so that he can be strictly about you. But we are not strictly about each other. Come on, say amen. We're trying to hide the truth from other people. We don't want people to know the truth about us. Come on, say amen. It's the truth anyhow. We don't want folk to know the truth. But when you have love, I can trust you with the truth. Come on, say amen. If you have love, I can trust you with the truth. So, Dina, if you say you love me and I sit down and we start talking, I can share stuff with you, can't I? Because I know you have what? Love, genuine love for me. You're concerned about my well-being. You're concerned about whether I succeed or fail, aren't you? You're concerned if I get strong or weak, aren't you? So when I tell you my stuff, what are you going to do? Pray for me. Are you listening to me, church? Let's go on. We got love. A love that is not selfish. A love that is selfless. Jesus was always saying, I do everything in my name. No. But you know, what, is he, what does he say? He says he's always doing in the name of the Father. In fact, even in this Bible text that we read in, in, in John 17, what is Jesus doing? Praying for himself? Praying for whom? Praying for us. But not only just praying for us, I want them to be victorious. No, it's not just victory he wants. He wants us to be what? one with him. Not only does he want us to be one with him, he wants us to be one with him as he is one 
with the Father. He's always pointing to the Father. And he's asking us to do the same thing. Come on, say amen. That's the kind of love we need to have, a selfless love, a love that seeks for other individuals. Philippians 2 says, Do nothing through strife or vain glory, but let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not on your own things, but also on the what? Things of others. You need to be concerned about your own stuff. I'm not asking you not to be concerned about your own stuff. Because we have to. We have to take care of our families. We have to take care of our jobs. We've got to do things. But the Bible says, look not on your own things, but also on the things of others. I have, I have a cartoon on my, on, my, on, my, on my wall. Someone gave it to me not too long ago. And I may have told you the story, but I, it just came to my mind. And I just wanna, wasn't going to even talk about it. But let me just let me share this cartoon with you. This cartoon's on my door, or excuse me, on my wall, right behind me. Love this cartoon. There, there's a dinosaur. Excuse me, hippopotamus. Looked like a dinosaur. Hippopotamus, big, big hippo. And the hippo has come to a precipice. And on the precipice, he has fallen over. Now, because of his weight, he cannot pull himself up over the cliff. He's falling, he's hanging on and looking for help. That's, one, that's the first caption. So as you continue to watch the cartoon, he's got a little dog. The dog's running in like this. And he runs in. And he looks, the next caption is, he sees his friend the hippo, hanging on for dear life on the precipice. He looks at his friend, and then he spies a rock. But before he spies the rock, he does what? He tries to pull his friend up. But the hippo, being a little too heavy, the little dog can't pull the hippo up. But he spies the rock. He grabs the rock, walks over to his friend the hippo, and smashes down the rock on the hippo's head. <laughs> Caption reads, Friends may not be able, thank you. Friends may not be able to lift you up but they'll think of ways not to let you fall. Come on, say amen. Friends may not be able to lift you up, but they'll think of ways not to let you fall. That's love. Jesus prayed for us. Sometimes it's not the kind of help we think we need. Do I think I need a rock on my head? No. But if that's all you've got, then give me a rock on my head. Come on, say amen, church. Sometimes Jesus can't do it the way we want him to do it, but he gets the job done. Amen? Because he's seeking to help you. But let's move on. We're talking about love in that section, but now Jesus has compassion. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. The Bible reads like this. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Is it all right if I take my coat off? Thank you so very much, and thank you for the help, my friend. So I can take off my coat and not feel bad anymore. Amen. I'm losing weight, y'all. Amen. Doing insanity, Dina. It's insane, too. Matthew 15, verse 32. The Bible says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, 
I have compassion. What did he say? We're going to find out what compassion is today. I, have, I studied this thing out. I had to figure out what compassion. Compassion is just not love and feeling good about people, feeling sorry for them. It's not even feeling sorry for them. I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. Now, you guys all know this story. And we always talk about the little boy with the fish and the loaves and how we take, they took up 12 baskets and all that afterwards. And the miracle was that everybody, all those people got a chance to eat. But I want to emphasize today the fact that Jesus says he took compassion on the multitude because they had been with him so long, three days, and he's now concerned about their health. Number one, we said earlier, he's concerned about their needs. Come on, say amen. He's concerned about their individual stuff. But compassion means that you're not only concerned, you actually feel what other people are feeling. So whatever they need, you need too. I had to understand compassion. It's not just feeling sorry for people. People don't necessarily need for you, you go to say, I feel sorry for you, or I have so I'm sorry that you went into that problem or this thing happened to you. Some folk need for you to just understand their need. My wife told me not to talk about it, so I can't talk about it. Uh-oh. Come on now. Something's on. It's on. Uh, hello. Am I good yet? Okay. I'll just use my preaching voice. Compassion is not only sympathy. Are we here? Are we on? Well, I'm on. Amen. Compassion is not only feeling sorry for people, showing sympathy, and it's not only showing empathy. I had to get past empathy too. I had to know what Jesus was really talking about. Jesus said, I am hungry, and they're hungry too. Yes, you guys didn't even get that. If I'm hungry, they must be hungry. She still didn't get it. Still didn't get it. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say we are camping. And it's in a very hot and humid place. And we're down to one canteen of water. And I got the water. Now, what do you guys need? And what am I going to do with my water? I'm going to drink my water. Right? Because I'm what? I'm thirsty. But what else am I going to do with the water? I'm going to share the water. Compassion is sharing. It's not just seeing the need, it is satisfying the need. Come on, say amen. Most of us see the need, and, they, and most of us say, I'll pray for you. You hear what I said, church? Most of us see the need, but I'll pray for you. Compassion moves you. No. Compassion drives you. No. Compassion compels you. 
to satisfy the need. It's not sympathy. I don't feel sorry for you because you, you're thirsty. I don't even really empathize with that. But I know if you don't drink this water, you'll die. You hear what I said? It is a compelling force that drives us to give no matter what it takes. I will give you my last drink of water so that you will survive. Are you hearing me? Elijah told the lady to do what? You can ready to make a cake for you and your son and you don't eat that and die. Give it to me. He called the lady out of her pain. She got just a few, just one little can of oil, some meal. She's going to make it together, make a little cake, eat that and die. Elijah said, give it to me. When you really love people, it will compel you to hear the man of God, hear the need, and satisfy it even at your own peril. Are you listening to me, church? Even at your, your own peril. Amen. You satisfy the need. Are you with me? Compassion satisfies the need. Finally, my brother, the one I really want to get to anyway, is understanding. Turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The Bible says in chapter 5, verse 15. Let's start at verse 14 so we'll get the picture. You already know this story. You know what's getting ready to happen. But let's just read it for effect. The Bible says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Did you hear the word pray over? And then he says, Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, verse 15 is paramount. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. I want you to put a pin on 15, because we're coming back to it and finish. Jump with me now to verse 20. The Bible says, Let him know it that he that covereth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, you got that picture in your mind? You got the picture in your mind now, right? It says, and if any commit sins, they shall be forgiven him. But now the prayer in verse 20 is, let him know that person who's praying that he, that he which covereth the sinner, that's the praying individual, from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of of sin. Got that picture in your mind now, right? Now let's jump back to verse 15, verse 16. The Bible says, confess your faults one with another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The Bible says clearly that you can be healed by the prayer of one of your friends. Come on, say amen. Now, I, I know that we always want to talk about this prayer being the prayer that lifts people up when they're sick and on their bed, deathbed or their bed of affliction. But I want you to know there's a principle involved here. The principle is, it says, confess your faults one with another. I preached it and I'm preaching it again. Here it is. When we confess our faults, we are able to share one with another so that we now become accountable
we become accountable to each other. The reason why we don't pick up on that text is because we don't want to tell folk about what we're doing. We don't want folk to know what's going on in our house. We don't want folk to know our troubles and our ills. You're right, my brother. What, what did you say, Dina, earlier? Denial? I'm offering to you the suggestion that the desire of ages says that his desire is that we be one with him. If we're going to be one with Jesus, he says you've got to tell the truth. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, oh. whoa, we got to tell the truth no matter what the cost because it satisfies the need. Come on, say amen. Oh, you didn't get it? You didn't get it. You see, when we share from ourselves, people hear truthfulness. They see transparency. They see someone who's concerned, who's compassionate, and we are moved. Come on, say amen now. We are moved. We are compelled. Because now we understand what you're going through. I'm talking to you now. I'm listening to you, Genevieve. I know the stories that you've been telling me now. I know what they mean now. I know how you're feeling about it. I'm empathetic. I'm sympathetic. But more importantly, I'm compelled. Is that better? Yeah, the battery's low. My battery's not low. I'm feeling good today. Amen. I feel like I can do shit for some other day. We are compelled. You see, Jesus believes in love. Say love. He believes in, excuse me. He believes in compassion, but most of all, he believes in understanding. He understands what you're going through. He understands. I used to think, I used to pray to God, God, you don't know what it's like being fat. People touch your stomach. They look at the first thing they say, man, is, boy, you're gaining weight. You're a little portly, aren't you? I'm like, really? I'm dying over here. I look at pictures of myself, and I'm like, wow. My daughter said, Dad, I want you to look like that. I'm like, I'll never look like that. And I'm saying, God, you don't know what it's like. Jesus was buff. He was a lumberjack. He carried the wood, made the furniture. He was a carpenter. He didn't know what it's like to be fat. That's my prayer. Seriously. And then I say, Jesus, I know you care. He understands. He knows how I'm feeling. And he's working it out. That's what we have to do with each other. We've got to work it out. But you got to be truthful. God, I'm fat. Help me. Sheila, I love eating chocolate. I love drinking juice. All the things I know I'm not supposed to do. Pray for me. That's a serious prayer request. Pray for me. I'm losing it. Are you guys with me? I'm trying to make this as personal as I can. Because Jesus loves us unselfishly. 
truthfully. He loves us, un- thank you, unconditionally. He loves and has compassion on us, but most of all, he understands us. Come on, say amen. He doesn't have to know what that is. He made me. Are you with me? He made you. He knows what you need. Alex, some of that stuff we've been talking about, some of that relational stuff, we know that God's still on the case. Are you with me, church? And that's the God I serve. Come on, say amen. So now, church family, I'm, I am carrying a weight today. I'm carrying a weight for you. I'm car- Anita, I'm carrying a weight for you because I know some of the stuff you're dealing with. Morgan, where's Morgan? She out in that church? Tell her I'm carrying a weight for her. I'm carrying a weight for you, Alice. I'm carrying a weight for you, Sheila Genevieve, Sister Falcone, brother, sister, Art. I'm carrying a weight because I want to see you in the kingdom. And so whatever I need to do, I'm going to do. Are you listening to me? I'm going to say this and I'm going to sit down. That's why I'm still here. Father in heaven, we're carrying a weight. All of us are carrying weights. But we can have those weights delivered today if we help one another, if we have love and compassion and understanding. Father, we've got to be able to talk to each other by, with, with, with understanding. How do we do that, Lord? By being honest and truthful in our confessions. Not our sins. We don't have to confess our sins, but confess our faults, the, the problems that we're going through. Lord, I'm fat. Jesus, I know, and each one of us knows that if we could find a friend in you, we can certainly find a friend on this planet who we can be accountable to so that we can be victors, so that we can stop hiding behind the stuff that we are doing so that we can stop being in denial, so that we can stop putting on blinders, so that we can be victorious. And we give you the praise now. We give you the honor for the love, the compassion, and the understanding of our fellow men, especially our church family members here at Rolling Hills. In Jesus' name, let the church say, amen.